That's a busy schedule. It's, it's huge. You see, it was yeah. supposed to be yeah. um, um, a live event, and then because of COVID, we couldn't run yeah. it. And yeah. then it had to be moved online. Okay. Um, but it's, it's a packed week. I was, yeah. I was at the um, opening event earlier this morning. That was also really exciting. You know, it's it's a it's oh. a big big topic at the moment. Very nice. Very nice. Um, and and also it's always it's exciting. We're just going through transition with the new director coming in. Okay. Um, so Adam Habib, who spoke this morning, he will take up the directorship in January. Okay, I see. Nice. Um, and you know he you know he has he is a, you know very you know very well versed and you know quite well known in that area. Yeah. Um, okay. So it was a really interesting discussion, Great. and then. You know, I, I can say a little bit more about it just now in the introduction, but it's a really nice mix of events. It's invest there's panel discussions, talks, uh, performances, things. That's great. Is it a yearly uh, event? It's it's the first time we're doing it this way. There's you know, yeah. um, there's a number of of other events. There's you know, it's called Being Human Festival, which brings okay. together a number of universities. I see. Um, this one in this form, it's the, it's the first one, and I think so far it's really successful. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, 80 attendance, 80 attendance is actually very, very high. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's generating a lot of this. You see, the nice thing, so so I have two in two minds with the um with the COVID situation because you can't travel, which is a real hindrance. That's true. <laughs> but of course, everybody can join all these online events. That is correct, yeah. That is correct. Um, so in that sense, it makes it much more accessible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it makes sense. That's probably why the reason uh, the attendance is usually higher. Because people are now locked down in their homes. <laughs> it's like, yes. you know. mm. um, but also really for bringing international communities together. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the yeah. hustle and the cost and also the environmental cost of flying yeah. you know, to a conference, I don't know. In, in yeah. or, definitely, or, definitely. Or in Accra, and you know, you're there for two, three days, you fly back. Yeah. Whereas yeah. like this, it's a much lower impact. Yeah, um, yeah, and you can you can do more of it, um, it and also we moved to to teaching online as well, um, and that's also makes it interesting. Um, let me see what I have to do anything. Um, oh, we are on air, gentlemen. I'm so sorry. Everybody can hear our conversation. I you know I, I think it was nothing uh, nothing controversial we said, um, but maybe I should also mute myself um, before we start. Um, good. I think I got the I got the green light. It's um, 1904. So I, you know, yeah. I think I'll start. So let's wait another little minute just uh, for people to join, um, and then I kick off um, uh, officially. Um, um, we have a little. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm just checking attendance. Um, good. Um, 1905. Um, Let's get started. Very good indeed. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening here in London, that is. It's um, seven o'clock in the evening, but also good morning, good afternoon to everyone uh, who is in other places and, and other time zones. 
Um, my name is Lutz Martin. I'm um, based here at SOAS. I'm a professor of general and African linguistics. Um, and I'm very pleased to be the host for this exciting event um, today. Um, the event today is part of our um, SOAS virtual festival of ideas, uh, which is a week long series starting today um, of virtual events, including panel discussions, student led installations, masterclasses, performances, and um, public debates and keynote lectures. Um, and indeed the lecture this evening um, is the first of these, um, these keynote lectures. Um, um, the event, the festival of ideas started today, so we have the opening this morning. Um, so please join us, so there will, uh, there will be events for the rest of the week up to Friday. Please join us throughout the week uh, for the many exciting, brilliant, um, challenging sometimes, uh, but certainly engaging um, events which are still to come. Um, the overarching theme of the festival is decolonizing knowledge. Um, and we will take the week to critically review and question processes of knowledge production, learning, um, teaching universities, um, and bring together different audiences and communities uh, to join the conversation. Um, decolonizing knowledge, of course, resonates a lot throughout the world at the moment, throughout Africa, certainly. Um, here at SOAS, we've been, we've been working quite a bit on different aspects of decolonizing. So it's really nice to bring this work together in a, in a very concentrated form throughout the week. Um, in the uh, opening event this morning uh, with the keynote address by, by Professor Adam Habib, um, who many will know as a leading thinker in the area of, of decolonizing knowledge and decolonizing universities, uh, but who is also the incoming director of SOAS. He will join us as the new director in January. Um, this morning, the discussion kicked off with, with a variety of different aspects um, of decolonizing knowledge. Um, relating to teaching and the curriculum, agendas of social change, um, activism with academia, uh, the role of, of humanities, um, arts, languages, and social sciences, and the interaction there. Um, and also um, with the rethinking of the institution and financial structures um, in which universities operate. So all these themes, I'm sure, will be taken up throughout the week. Um, one particular aspect which was mentioned this morning is particularly relevant to today's lecture. Um, and that is the question of whose knowledge matters, whose knowledge is heard, whose knowledge is represented, on, on which knowledge are academic discourses based. Um, and our, our distinguished and esteemed guest speaker today, um, Professor Falun Dom, um, has made key contributions to this question. Um, and we are very pleased indeed that he's joining us today um, and will share with us some of his thinking. Um, Professor Ngom is Professor of Anthropology at Boston University. Um, his research interest includes the interaction between African languages and non-African languages um, in language contact situations, um, the adaptations of Islam in Africa and Ajami literature. So this is what, something which we uh, will focus on today. Um, that is records of African languages written in enriched forms um, of the Arabic scripts, um, both in Africa and in, in the diaspora. Um, his recent work focuses on Islam and grassroots literacies in Africa, on social linguistics and linguistic anthropology, and his 2016 book, on which part of what he is talking about today will be based, um, Muslims Beyond the Arab World, the Odyssey of Ajami um, and the Moridia, uh, published by Oxford University Press, um, won the 2017 Melville J. Herskowitz Prize for the best book in African studies. So it has um, has made a strong, strong impact um, and really changed a lot of the thinking in that area and has made many of us um, rethinking our understanding of, of literary practices in Africa. Um, he has also uh, recently co-edited um, with Mustafa Kofi and uh, Toyin Falola the um, Polgrave Handbook of Islam and Africa. It's, I think it's a more than 30 chapters, a substantive volume uh, which came out uh, earlier this year. So on that, uh, many congratulations. Um, and overall, his work touches on language, languages, linguistics, writing, knowledge production and perception of knowledge production. Um, and he directs direct several research projects related to Ajami, both, so the uh, uh, writing of African languages in Arabic script, um, both in terms of its use in African traditional writing, established writing, um, but also in the modern virtual world. Um, he was awarded earlier this month a large grant 
um, for creating digital Ajami materials in Hausa, Wolof, and Mandinka. Um, and so his work um, very pointedly and you know, very impressively um, combines erudite scholarship of, of, in a very ad academic vein, um, but also um, practical applications in education and, and changing literary practices now and, and for, for young generations. Um, so it's a, it's a huge span of activities. So we're very, very pleased to have, um, to have Professor Ngom with us. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to end introducing uh, Falun Gom and hand over um, the screen, as it were, to him. Um, um, Falun Gom will speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes, a bit longer, if, if you like. Um, we have two hours slot. After that, there is the opportunity for questions. Please, for questions, use our, our Q&A function. Um, and then you can type the questions in the QHA function. Please do not use the chat because that gets a little bit confusing sometimes. Um, and then, and then we, can, we can collate them, read them out, and then have an have a informed discussion um, after the lecture. Um, with that, thank you very much, Falu, for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very, very much. I am uh, very honored to uh, participate in this important event. I hope uh, everyone is uh, fine, despite the difficult situations in which we are. And thanks to uh, Professor Martin Lutz uh, for the introduction and uh, uh, for re really framing the debate uh, of today. I just also want to thank uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, Girand and uh, uh, Kumi for helping to make this uh, meeting possible. I am extremely grateful. And I think that Professor Lutz has introduced the topic beautifully uh, by framing it as an issue of uh, decolonizing knowledge, whose knowledge matters and the perceptions of knowledge production. So I think this is uh, an important topic that uh, deserves attention uh, from not only scholars, but uh, people in applied areas, including education, uh, uh, government, uh, business, and all the professionals who work in Africa. Uh, what I wanna do is uh, to talk about what I call the Odyssey of Ajimi in Africa. Uh, the sources that are written in African languages using the modified Arabic script. Uh, what do they contain? What form uh, do they have? Uh, what information are we missing when we disregard them in our production of knowledge? So that would be the center of my talk. And uh, as you can see in the two images, these are archives uh, that I have found in Senegambia. And uh, the person that you see is uh, clearly not illiterate, though in the official statistics, he is regarded as illiterate. Uh, to begin, I would like just to give some general background about uh, why is uh, Ajami traditions in general uh, overlooked, I think that's partly because of the overemphasis on oral traditions and, and colonial archives that have rendered largely invisible important written materials in non-Latin uh, scripts, particularly in regions where orality and literacy have been interlaced for centuries. So when we tend to present Africa as uh, the continent of orality per excellence, we're actually uh, uh, ignoring the fact that in many areas in Africa, uh, orality and literacy are interlaced. When you have a poem that is written and the poem is chanted, where do you draw the line? Is this a written or an oral text? These are not mutually exclusive. And I think that's one of the problems. These written materials in non-Roman scripts 
and those to be on earth produced by people that Osman Khan uh, refers to as non-Europhone African intellectuals can significantly enhance teaching and research on Africa. So I will uh, focus on the Ajami archives that I know better in this talk. First, what is Ajami? Uh, the word comes from the Arabic word for non-Arab, and it evolved to refer uh, to the practice of writing other languages using the modified Arabic script. So it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, Urdu, uh, Persian, and other varieties, including among the Uyghurs in China, uh, modifying the Arabic script to write their own languages is very common. So what's happening in Africa is not really new. Ajami has played an important role in the spread of Islam across Sub-Saharan Africa, and indeed around the world. How does it work, really? In general, what happened is that the Arabic script is enriched with dots to write consonants uh, and vowels in some cases that do not exist in Arabic, but exist in local languages. So I call those powerful dots. Essentially, it's, it's dots that are used for diacritics. In this case, for example, this is an example of Wolof. These consonants do not exist in Arabic. So what the Wolof people did was uh, to use a ba, which exists in Arabic, and they added three dots on top, okay? So in some cases, the dot may be below, okay? But what matters is that there are three dots that distinguishes the p from the b, okay? So the same rule is applied for g, okay? You have three dots. And because it's not standardized, you may find text with variations, okay? Now, these variations have been emphasized by outsiders as a problem for Ajami uh, users. Uh, but in reality, that's not correct because these variations are actually challenges for outsiders, but not insiders, because insiders are familiar with the local variations in the text produced by their authors. So if the author is a popular poet in the, in, the, in, the, in the community, people are familiar with different variations. So these variations have been, uh, uh, I think one challenge for outsiders, but it's not really uh, for insiders. So I call these dots, uh, the powerful dots that are really used across the world to increase the uh, letters uh, based on the Arabic uh, uh, letters. So in the Hausa tradition, uh, the Mandinka tradition, uh, the Kanuri tradition, they might decide different dots or different diacritics, but the letters remain basically the same. So with this system, uh, in the same way, it's not different the way it is. it emerged, in the same way the Latin script spread through Christianity, the, so too the Arabic script spread through Islam and was modified to write numerous languages around the world. Of course, as you know, Christianity, uh, the spread of Christianity went along with, this, with the spread of uh, the Roman script. So it's not, it's not different. Most of these traditions initially emerged as part of the pedagogies to teach Islam to the illiterate masses. And uh, recent evidence indicates that the Arabic orthography itself uh, developed following the patterns observed in Ajami traditions. This is interesting because uh, what it shows is that uh, if you look at the traditions that are now using the modified Arabic script to write uh, their languages, whether it's uh, Urdu or Wolof or Hausa, uh, the dots that they use to increase the uh, consonants that they have is basically according to Daniel, the same pardon the same process that was used by early Arabs to write Arabic using modifying the Aramaic script. So if you look at the existing corpus of pre-Islamic Arabic language inscriptions dated from 328 and 568 CE, uh, Daniel notes that they were written in the Nabataean early Arabic script, which was based on Aramaic, on Aramaic script. So According to him, the Arabic orthography developed 
uh, from the Nabataean Arabs who, who modified the Aramaic script with diacritics in the same way Ajami uses today, uh, increasing the using uh, diacritics to be able to write consonants that did not exist in Arabic. So it's, it's, it's a process that continues in Ajami traditions of our, around the world and began probably before the Arabic script uh, uh, was adopted uh, as, 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 as a major writing system. So I think this is, this is for those who are interested in looking at the long durée uh, modifications that led to the Arabic script and that is also continuing to be used uh, to uh, write other languages. I think this, this, uh, this chapter is an important one uh, by uh, uh, Peter Daniels, the type and, sp and spread of the Arabic script, which was published in a very good book edited by Michael Munim and uh, Kies Vertier. To give you an idea of the scope of uh, Islam and the Arabic script, you can see uh, around the world, both the Arabic, both Arabic and, and the Arabic script, that is modifications of the Arabic script to write languages of, the, of, of Muslims is widespread. In Africa alone, there are about 80 languages uh, with written Ajami traditions. The problem of the exclusion of Ajami literacy in, in official statistics is, is so interesting because when you look at the statistics in general, official statistics, and these are United Nations other literacy rates, including uh, local governments, uh, uh, literacy rates, which are based on uh, uh, European uh, models of uh, literacy. Uh, for example, in 2006, it is said the United Nations other literacy rates reports that Senegal had 42%, Niger in 2005, 29%, Guinea, uh, a total of 38% in 2008, but these do not take into account Ajami users. According to CCA in 2003, uh, a limited census conducted in Labe uh, in Guinea Conakry, in Jurbel, Mata, Podor uh, in Senegal, and Niger and uh, Nigeria revealed that in the Labe area alone in Guinea, there are over 70% Ajami uh, literates, uh, and among them, 20 to 25 uh, are women. Uh, in Jurbel, Mata, and Podor in Senegal, there are over 70% Ajami literacy. In Hausa areas of uh, Niger and uh, Nigeria, over 80% uh, Ajami uh, have Ajami literacy. So African Ajami literates are really misrepresented in official literacy statistics because uh, literacy is defined as the ability to read and write in European languages and the ability to use the Roman script. And I think this is um, uh, a legacy that African colonial legacy that African governments haven't been able to, haven't changed. And that explains why uh, Ajayi militaries are, uh, are underrepresented. This narrow colonial understanding of literacy espoused by African government and international organizations continue to exclude millions of Ajami uh, users in Africa. So the problem is when we ignore these, this is what we are missing. Uh, this is a list of non-exhaustive uh, uh, themes that I have found in the collections we have at Boston University. We've, uh, we have over 30,000 pages uh, of Ajami and Arabic materials from Africa uh, across uh, several languages. And when I look at the themes, these are the major, major ones that I found. So the, the documents that deal with talismanic protective devices, uh, astrology, divination, religious and didactic materials in poetry and prose, elegies, translations of work on Islamic metaphysics, jurisprudence, Sufism, translations of the Quran from Arabic into African languages, secular writings, such as commercial and administrative record keepings, family genealogies, records of important local events, such as foundations of villages, birth, death, weddings, biographies, 
political and social satires, advertisements, road signs, public announcements, speeches, personal correspondences, traditional treatment of illnesses, medicinal plants, incantations, history, local customs and tradition and ancestral traditions, and texts on diplomatic matters, behavioral codes and grammar. So uh, these are some of the themes that we find in our collections. And of course, clearly, by not engaging Ajami sources, we're missing a lot about African knowledge uh, systems recorded in uh, non-Roman scripts. To come to my book, so it's the uh, recognition of the Ajami traditions and their significance in, uh, in Africa that led me to investigate the Murid community where Ajami plays a significant role and where uh, the Ajami, wall of Ajami tradition has been deployed as a mass communication tool to convey the teaching of a particular Sufi leader called Shah Ahmed Obama, who founded the Muridiya Sufi order in 1883. So Shah Ahmed Obama had been deprived of freedom by the French colonial authorities for 32 years. And uh, yet his movement continued to grow and, 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 and expanded when scholars have argued that the movement will disappear as soon as he dies, which didn't happen. And I found out that in fact, the reason why the movement did not die is that the movement was supported by the use of Ajami as a means of, of, of mass communication that uh, was not censored because the colonial system was actually unaware of it. So what I did in the book is therefore uh, to show how Murids use the written, recited and chanted Ajami text as a means, as an effective mass communication tool in conveying Shah Ahmed Obama's poignant story, uh, doctrine and the virtues he cultivated among his followers. And I found that some of the virtues that really made the movement strive and resilient, despite the deportations and house arrests that uh, Ahmed Bamba was uh, subjected to by the French colonization. These virtues that appealed to the masses included self-esteem, self-reliance, strong faith, work ethic, pursuit of excellence, determination, and optimism in the face of adversity. In fact, these were the themes that were being written in Ajumi and chanted in local villages that completely evaded the French uh, intelligence offices, uh, officers. And I think the reason why the movement succeeded when it was not expected was that they were communicating in a language and a script that was not understood by the French colonial officers who assumed that these were uh, uneducated and ignorant Africans who were uh, probably chanting uh, traditional pagan songs. Okay. So I think this is an important lesson that we learned by uh, uh, showing, which shows the importance of engaging local sources uh, because without these local sources, I would not have understood that in fact, what made the movement resilient and successful even today is it is one of the most powerful economically, culturally and politically in Senegal. Uh, is because actually that Ajami has been used purposefully as a mass communication strategy. And this was done without the knowledge of the French colonial authorities. So how does it work? And how does Ajami uh, literacy emerge? Ajami literacy is derived from the Quran. So I call it a Quranic derived literacies. Uh, and as you can see, these kids are exposed to the Quranic school using these wooden tablets. Uh, so you have both girls and boys. And as they uh, read the Quran, copies, the chapters of the Quran, verses of the Quran are written on these uh, wooden tablets. As they memorize them, uh, uh, they, when they memorize each chapter, a new chapter is written, okay? And after that phase, they learn how to read, uh, how to read and write those chapters. Okay, that's how they were first exposed to the Arabic script. Now the Arabic script that is used in these uh, Quranic schools across West Africa 
is based on the Warsh classical Arabic script. And I think this is important because there are seven recitations of the Quran called the seven Qiraat. And one of the Qiraat uh, is the one from Imam Warsh. And it is this variety of classical Arabic that is the basis of uh, Ajami in West Africa, which means those who speak standard Arabic based on uh, uh, Hafs writing might have problems reading Ajami text because the basis is Warsh, not Hafs. Okay. So as they finish the Quranic school, the first level of the Quranic school, which is using the wooden tablets to learn the verses, uh, the second layer of education, the second level of education is that they have to write a copy of the Quran uh, uh, from memory. And this is an example of a 15 year old boy writing his first handwritten copy of the Quran in Senegal. Uh, it's a picture I took in 2016. And you can see uh, this is a page. And once they're done with the, uh, the, 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 the verse or the, the surah, they will now add the vocalizations. Okay, so this is a page without vocalization. I might note that usually uh, no, no numbers are added because the first word of the next page is written here. Okay, so which allows uh, people to know the next page. Okay. Uh, when students go through this process, they become literate, dual literate, they acquire dual literacy. They acquire literacy in Arabic, classical Arabic, Warsh based, but they also acquire the local Ajami tradition that is based on the Warsh tradition. And in the Mandinka areas, if they, they, they haven't dropped out and they continue uh, to study uh, say poetry or to study uh, the higher levels in higher levels in uh, other uh, areas of Islamic knowledge, including fiqh, uh, jurisprudence or grammar, or law, etc. They might travel and go to a place where a, a, you know, a specialist is known to be, and then they might work with that person. So, but what's interesting, this is a case, for example, of a copy of a, Quran, uh, of, of a poem that ends with Dal, 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 as you can see here. And the teacher might ask the student to make a copy of a 300 pages of a, of a particular poem in one particular genre, okay? And then uh, the teacher might meet the student and comment on, uh, on, on the student's writings, okay? And these comments are important because they could be multilingual, okay? So if the discussions was, for example, uh, if the teacher assumed that he has taught the student one concept in, in Mandinka, some of, the, some of the comments may be in Mandinka. If the content was taught, if the content, say, of this word was uh, explained, say, in Hausa, you might find that the comments here might be in Hausa. Okay, what you end up having is a text that is multilingual, that reflects multilingualism and multiliteracies. And clearly showing that these people that we're regarding as illiterate, then, then they're actually not illiterate. They, they're not only literate, they're multiliterate and, and, and multilingual. And I think these texts uh, reflect the complexities and the wealth of knowledge that is found in these Ajami traditions that um, we are yet to uh, really uh, fully, fully grasp. Additionally, these texts may also be transmitted from family to family, which means some family members may add new comments. So you could trace generation. For example, you could see this one is blue. It's clearly added recently. Okay, you could find this one is this comment is blue here and these glosses. So you can track genealogies uh, through these uh, these Ajami texts. The kind of scholars we have in Ajami traditions, I have categorized them in three groups. The first group is the group I call the social scientists. The second group is the group I call the esoteric scholars. And the third group is a group I call poets and singers. So uh, this categorization is by no mean to be a generalization. It is simply intended to reflect the major trends I have observed in the works of these uh, scholars. Uh, so the social scientists are those who uh, conduct fieldwork in many, in, in many ways like uh, us. 
So they travel from places to places, they collect the data, they analyze the data, and they cite sources. In fact, they cite sources, uh, they say, you know, they, they ground them in, in, in the literature, you know. And uh, the esoteric scholars are the ones who are usually invested in metaphysics, uh, say in Khatims, uh, uh, in numerology, uh, in astronomy, uh, astronomy and astrology, actually both. Um, and um, in uh, Ilmul uh, Nujum and, and, and all the uh, Islamic sciences that are part of the uh, uh, metaphysical realm. And then you have uh, poets and singers who usually actually uh, read or chant uh, poems, but also many of the prose texts are also recited and read so that the dissemination uh, is, is, is wide. So, for example, in the Muri community, most of the texts that are written, whether they are prose or poetry, okay, have oral versions. Okay. So again, here I want to emphasize how the dichotomy between orality and written, you know, uh, literature are not mutually exclusive; they are actually complementary. So this is an example of a Mandinka Ajami social scientist. Uh, he is an Imam. Uh, I call him. His name is Imam Manjang. And I met him um, in our last uh, uh, project in Kazamaz. And I collected some of the, some texts from him. And these are some of the themes in his, in his archives. War and peace in Kazamaz and the world. There were themes that dealt with uh, dangers of alcoholism, drug use and divorce, uh, pre-colonial and anti-colonial Mandinka leaders in the region. Uh, historical notes on the on the powerful once powerful Mandinka Kabu Empire uh, from the 15 uh, 1537 to 1867, whose capital was Kansala, and there were even descriptions of the fortresses, uh, the rulers, and uh, the wars they fought, and other important military figures. So uh, we also find some interesting elements in his collection, including. Uh, notes on the decolonization war in Guinea-Bissau, um, uh, including the military leaders of the PAIGC, the arrival of the Portuguese in Guinea-Bissau and Southern Senegal in the 15th century, and the founding of the Combo Gunjur in the Gambia. And then also a, a, a work song called Joka, which is very interesting and fun to listen to. Uh, so these are, these are just examples of uh, uh, themes that we find in the works of social scientists, uh, Ajami social scientists like him. Another one is Abibu uh, Rasulusi, whose document I found very interesting. In the cover page, it notes that, uh, and this is again writing about the ancestry of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, uh, the Murid, uh, founder of the Muridia. And he wrote somewhere that uh, the grandfather was born in Aikashi, uh, and died in Sanyanja in Yurishi. Now, for many, for outsiders who do not know this system, and, and even if they speak Wolof, they might think that this is gibberish. Okay. When in reality, these are dates, these are dates using letters. So these are chronograms. So if you were to break this, uh, it's based on the alpha uh, numeral system. Uh, in this case of the of the west or the western one, uh, which is shared by West Africa and North Africa, as opposed to the eastern ones, because there's some minor differences. But in this case, the Y equals ten, the Q equals a hundred, the Sh equals a thousand, and if you convert that in Anum Hijra in the Muslim uh, calendar, it will give you one thousand one hundred ten, and if you take the death date. Uh, Yurushi, so it's a consonantal base. Ye stands for 10, R equal to 100, Sh equals 1000. It brings you to 1210 Anum Hijra. So if you convert these days into the Gregorian calendar, you would get 1698 and 1795. So which means that the person being discussed here actually lived uh, to up to uh, 100 years. You know? So this is interesting because many historians who have studied these societies assuming that they oral, that they only have oral traditions, or even if they have texts, those texts must not be of importance. These documents clearly show the importance that these documents, that these sources of knowledge could have in decolonizing knowledge and actually helping to get better dating okay, of the 
uh, sources uh, in the region. So clearly, these would have uh, uh, such documents have uh, potential contribution uh, in uh, African historiography that has that has not yet been uh, exploit, exploited. Um, and again, so I just wanted to note that uh, while it's true that uh, many of the Ajami writers are male, uh, there are equally important women who have also written Ajami text, uh, either poetry and prose. Uh, the most known one is clearly the daughter of Usman Damfodio uh, in Hausa land, Nana Asmao. But we also have, say, in Senegambia, among the wall of, for example, Sona Maimuna Tumbake, a daughter of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, the founder of the Muridia Sufi order, who also wrote some Ajami poetry. And uh, she is remembered in her community as a loving mother a teacher, poetess, and a moral exemplar. So between 1974 and 1975, she wrote a popular Ajami poem, which is still recited by uh, young kids uh, who attend Quranic schools, in which he presents her condolences to her husband and family for her own daughter they lost at a young age. So that's a very poignant uh, uh, poem. So it's a very moving poem, regularly read and recited. Uh, enchanted in uh, Senegalese communities, particularly in the Murid, Murid areas. Another area where Ajami might help to decolonize knowledge and to enhance our understanding of um, African uh, knowledge systems and African societies is this text where it's clear that uh, uh, the genealogy that we have here highlights the importance of uh, kinship, but also the elasticity of ethnicity. So, in general, we, uh, are, we, we are very familiar with uh, uh, areas in Africa where ethnicity has led to many conflicts, right? But there are also areas where ethnicity is actually very flexible and that uh, 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 um, et ethnic mixing uh, is the norm. And this is the case because this document shows us that uh, uh, the family of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba uh, from the 17th to the 20th century, the ethnic transformation, the incorporation from one ethnic group to the dominant ethnic groups in Senegal, which is the Wolof, uh, from a maternal, uh, the maternal and paternal lineages of Ahmed Bamba. The document traces the Fulani roots of the family to its full Wolofization, including the first person in the family who became fully Wolofized and spoke only Wolof. Another area that is uh, important uh, in Ajami sources that cuts across uh, the Ajami materials uh, in West Africa are texts dealing with local medicine. Right? So this is an excerpt of a table of content from Wolof Ajami tradition. And uh, clearly, Louis Fight Sochent, uh, uh, what heals varicella, and you have many other healing any type of eye pain, healing rheumatism, healing stomachache, healing headache, healing sore throat, healing toothache, healing someone who cannot urinate, uh, benefits of the pirate's tongue for healing children with speech disorder. So you have many, many, many uh, issues like that being treated. So another area that I think this understanding and studying this Ajami document might be helpful is uh, in uh, reconstructing pre-colonial diplomacy. For example, uh, this document I found in the archives uh, in France, uh, in um, uh, Aix-en-Provence, is that she uh, colonial. It shows this is a deal between uh, King Louis XVIII of France and King of Bar of the Gambia. Okay, so basically what happened is that King of France uh, came to West Africa, particularly in the Gambian region, and was looking for opportunities for trade. And uh, he was invited uh, by King of Bar, and uh, King of Bar asked him to make his proposition. And the King of France dictated his proposition to his scribe, which is represented here. And the king of Bar responded, asked his scribe to respond to his pro, to the proposition of the other monarch, which is which is this part. Okay, so you can see when the balance of power between this European and this uh, African uh, ruler were the same, 
Ajami was clearly recognized as a diplomatic means of communication, right? But well, as soon as the balance of power shifted in favor of Europeans, all the descendant, descendants of Ajami, uh, of King Bar, who are using Ajami, are regarded today as illiterate, which means that literacy is also about power. You know? And which is, uh, and I might note here, which is this has this formula has often also misled many scholars, because of course, of course, when Muslims write, they always write with Bismillah, begin with Bismillah Rahman Rahim which is a formula, a doxology, which is commonly used by uh, Muslims whenever they write. But the rest is Wolof. Everything else is Wolof. So many scholars have been able to read this, you know, but they can't read the rest. And they assume that the rest is gibberish. And in some cases, they call them uh, incorrectly unreadable Arabic or undecipherable Arabic, when in reality, it's Wolof or Hausa or another language. So, but Ajami traditions are not dead, even if they're not recognized by uh, many of these governments, because people continue to use Ajami to run their businesses, okay? And there are extensive uh, literature, bureaucratic literature that shows the institutions, how they work, okay? And these are two examples that I find from the Murid community. Uh, this is written by a woman uh, who is a descendant of Shah, uh, Shah Ibrafal, an important uh, Murid uh, leader. Uh, known as the apostle of hard work. And in this text where she is calling the community to help her build uh, uh, a home in a land that was given to her, okay? And usually these calls are read in, in public, uh, in the uh, you know, at the radio or sometime um, uh, distributed copies are made and distributed. And Maurice respond to these very quickly. Okay? This is another uh, similar uh, document that reflect uh, 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 reception uh, of, of, of funds that were given to one particular leader. And this is a letter generated by the leader to acknowledge the recep reception of the, of the funds. So that brings me to another domain that we have also overlooked as we think about knowledge production and acquisition of literacy in Africa. Okay? As I said, the uh, understanding of literacy as only being uh, driven through the eye is, 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 is true, but it may not account for the multiple ways in which literacy is acquired in Africa, okay? And that orality doesn't necessarily exclude uh, written tradition. In this case, for example, this is a, this is a poem, uh, a, a co the cover of a poem, a very popular poem uh, on that, that is dedicated on Serin Sali Umbake, who was a former Murid uh, leader. Okay, you can see the poem, the copy of the poem and the chanted version was on a CD. Okay, which means that some people will be listening to the songs before they read the text. And it's, it's, for some people, it will be the listening of the poems that mem the memorization of the poems that would lead them to desire to learn the script and they therefore learn the script. Okay, so this form of literacy clearly is uh, what I call music derived literacy because the literacy is acquired primarily, it's driven primarily from the songs, the beautiful poems they hear. And these poems are usually very beautiful. They have local metaphors, local maxims, and they talk to the people so they can resonate with people. So let's listen uh, for one minute, uh, just to give you a sense. <laughs> May magani li juli ye pagwirda Adara Jay Salaholi ngay binde Deh Mabuir Salaholi ngay binde Adara Jay Sachiri May Mapchir Burechi O Bugana Sakan Bipuchir Adara Jay Sabapu bi ngay dohdi moor Deh Masabapu Deh Mayit Kuamu. Okay, so through these poems, Ajami literacy has expanded. Okay, but this was the traditional way of um, uh, expanding Ajami literature through these poems that were chanted in rural villages and then later moved into cassettes and then DVD and CDs now has moved to the, to the digital space. So what you have now, the same poems are now being shared online. As you can see here, over 78,576 have viewed this poem and, and they can, they can uh, listen to it and read. And 
in so doing, they're acquiring literacy without necessarily attending the Quranic school. And this is only true, this is true, not only true for Ajami, but it's also true for Arabic, okay? Because there are also Arabic poems in the community uh, being read and treated this way. So these are important areas of new investigation that I think would be useful uh, for uh, students of Africa to begin to understand the multiple modes that are used to produce literacy that, ha that has evaded uh, scholars for centuries. And uh, to conclude, we also have in our very practical, uh, short day-to-day -day, uh, uses of agony, like advertisement. Okay? In this case, you have uh, someone who is not very popular uh, and who is looking for customers and writes this serene law dam is a healer and a fortune teller. Any, anything you want is available at this location. Your problem will be solved, God willing. Serene law is very knowledgeable he is not well known, but now he is doing well. The distance to his place is 500 meters with peace. Clearly, this is an advertisement and the person clearly sees that the best way to reach the community is through writing an agenda. Interestingly, uh, cell phone companies like the French cell phone company is very, uh, is investing in agenda these days for clearly financial reasons. They understand that to reach out to the Murid community where Ajami dominates, they have to use Ajami. So in this case, business people are actually ahead of government office officials who continue to treat these people as illiterate. So this advertisement say water to call, message, message, internet, eh? internet. And then uh, this says, if you want to call, you have a reduction, you, you know, you, you, you have a deal uh, through Illimix. Okay. In Nigeria, uh, polit politicians are also very interesting while they, they might in, in, in public and then when it comes to uh, policies not promote Ajami, but in the political campaigns they might actually deploy Ajami to reach the masses. And this is the case of a election campaign in Nigeria in the Nupe uh, uh, Ajami collection. And, but more generally in the public uh, space, you find writings on walls like this one Clearly, in this Ajami, in this uh, on this image, Ajami is deployed as a mass communication tool, uh, and it says, "When you tell is a wall of warning, urinating prohibited at this place." Clearly, it's likely that uh, the the person understood that if he had wrote, if he had written French or another language, the message would not get through because the dominate the, 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 this space is dominated by Ajami users. We also have Ajami being used to teach foreign languages, just like English could be used to teach French or French to teach English, okay? Uh, in this case, you have a survival text, uh, bonjour, uh, you have bonjour, uh, and then you have the polar equivalent, tanawe tali, okay? So clearly this person has identified the need to teach French and his uh, primary uh, written uh, uh, means of communication is Ajami and is using Ajimi to teach French, okay? And finally, I cannot end without reading this poem. This poem is very important. This poem I discovered uh, in Kazamas and it's a poem cursing Adolf Hitler, okay? Because the war was affecting the community of this leader. And in this community, leaders who, spiritual leaders who's, who are Sufi and whose hearts are clean uh, have power. Their words have binary power power that can kill, and but power also that can bless. So in this case, his community was being affected because people were being drafted by the French to go to, to the war and many of them were coming wounded. So his best weapon was to deploy the power of his words. And this is what he said through cursing. And he called Adolf Hitler, Ikiler. Of course, as always, the first sentence, the first verse is in, is in good Arabic in the name Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, okay? And the rest is in Mandinka. So he said, Ikler the German has brought evil to the world. May God take away all his evil. If he is assisted by powerful demons, may those demons be destroyed. If he is helped by his political skills, may those skills be lost for good. May God bring evil on him so that he may fear himself and his deeds. May God throw thunder on him 
to destroy his skull and flesh. May he be betrayed by his own doctor. May he make him drink poison until he is unconscious. May the great angels destroy his planes and make them catch fire in the air and fall. No young man is here now. So it's, it's really coming home here, uh, resonating with what's happening in the community. You cause our people and our guests to run away. The first to run away were Arfan Jemme, Kamara, Maroon, and many others. As for Damfa, he's worried for his wife is pregnant and his children can't walk Iglea. As for Kan Jemme, he wept so hard until I felt sad for him. Evil is not good, Iglea. Eclair, may God destroy you inside your protected building. Eclair, may you have the sickness of swelling belly and swelling genital. It's interesting with these curses, we can see the, the public health uh, issues that were important in this period. May you feel the agony and cry and die. Amen, amen. May God fulfill our prayers. May the human race be saved from Ikilea's evil. You can see that this person's concern actually transcends his community. And then he concludes again in Arabic, in the name of the prophet and Sheikh Sadibu, whose curse is most feared. Okay. So poems like this, where do you place them? These are meant to be chanted and it's written, all of this is written in Mandinka and only the beginning and the end are written in Arabic. Are these written texts, oral texts? Are these religious or non-religious texts? These are interlaced in these uh, knowledge productions. In this knowledge system, these are not mutually exclusive. In conclusion, the, the bulk of the Ajami materials remain unstudied. So Africanists across the humanities and social sciences have a lot uh, of work to do. And I look forward to working with uh, Professor Lutz uh, uh, on the Ajami collections at the British uh, uh, Library and uh, at SOAS uh, on Swahili. Okay. Uh, some of the recently collected materials we have include translation of the Quran in Wolof, the Bible in Hausa Ajami uh, by missionaries, Qadhafi's Green Book in uh, Hausa Ajami and Fula and Mandinka materials that bear striking similarities with some of those produced by enslaved Africans in the diaspora, uh, in the Americas, in Brazil, in, um, in Jamaica. And I think this is an area that would be really important uh, to uh, connect uh, Africans in Africa today and the literacy and, and the writings of African displaced uh, outside of Africa uh, during the transatlantic slavery. These materials, when seriously studied, will enhance our understanding of various aspects of Islam in Africa, but also of pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. I would uh, be happy to answer your questions. Ah, I think I'm I'm online. I, I'm afraid we can't clap, but let me clap at least symbolically. Thank you <laughs> for a, for a, one, a wonderful presentation. I, I we had, there was comments in the chat and question answer. People really loved it, and it's it's really quite mind blowing. I will open the um, the floor just now for questions, but um, maybe let me comment a little bit. I think what is fascinating about that there are some you know discoveries when people find things out which take the field forward. But the really truly big discoveries are those where we all go, well, yes, of course, it's obvious. Why didn't we see that before? So when you said that, you know, this, I mean, the, all the, the vibrancy of the materials, the practices, the people involved, this is not like a sort of hidden thing which you have to dig. No, 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 it's not. It's not a yeah. small little nugget. Yeah. But then, as you said, and you're talking this for a century, this has been completely, you know, eluded yeah. scholarship. So that, you know, can you comment a little bit on that? Because that's yeah. quite curious in its own right. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I think the first uh, shock for me was these are invisible to uh, scholars because of um, the tradition through which they go in the educational system, right? So I was uh, as, as uh, blind to these uh, materials as I was growing up. In fact, 
I only realized that they're important after I moved to the United States and became a professor. And my dad died and uh, he had written Ajami uh, documents, including deaths. And he had a journal in which I was a character. Okay. So I collected those materials and I brought him you know, to my office when I was teaching at Western Washington University. And one day I just stumbled on these materials again. And, and I read, I, I, I studied Arabic okay, as a second language, but I was reading it and it was sounding Wolof. I said, this is interesting. Okay, so I checked and, and I understood what he was saying. And one of them was actually an, a, a, a debt that he had contracted. So I just called my brother and said, okay, just check if uh, Ibrahim Musuri Jallo is there and if actually my dad owed him money, right? So we, he checked and he said, actually, it's true. That man also had a notebook business record where he kept his debt. He was a shopkeeper. You know, if you know West Africa, you will know that the Fulani uh, from Guinea, they run the small shops, okay? And they keep their records in, in Pearl, uh, in, in Fulani. So he checked and said, yeah, he did owe me money. So I just began to say, okay, how could I be his son? And I just didn't, I thought he's illiterate, okay? Because we were told that anyone who, can, who can't read in French is illiterate. And so, so and I decided to apply for uh, a, a small grant from WADA, which is now at Boston University, interestingly, and it allowed me to go. And then to just to check the shopkeepers. But whatever I asked, actually he was there, <laughs> he was there, you know? So I think, I think it's primarily because of the uh, educational systems in which we are put. And in fact, we call in Wolof, Jangul, means he didn't, he's, he's uneducated. We call them Jangul. Okay. And, and that means the more uh, educated you are in the Western mode, the less aware you are of these uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's really the challenge. And I think that, but it's not hidden. In fact, they have their own, I mean, I have here a whole library. You can buy them in local markets. Uh, they have market copies, and, but they have sustained and I, they have developed their own infrastructure. That's what's interesting. Mm. Right? They have different, they said to, for example, in the Muris, they have invested in public presses uh, in, in, in they make their, uh, copies and the market is actually a very lucrative market. They have scribes who uh, specialize in writing letters. So if you're illiterate and you want to write to your family in the village, you come and you pay them uh, 50 cents and they write a letter for you. You say what you want and then they write for you. Okay. And if you have, uh, if you want to make an advertisement, you want to make uh, 1,000 copies of one letter, for example, or one announcement for an event, you pay them, they write beautiful, and then you can. So it's a whole business and a whole world I had no idea existed. Mm. Yeah. Really fascinating. And, you know, there's a small note I made when you showed the CD, I noticed that there was an address in Johannesburg. So that's right, that's right. The international that, dimension, yes. It's very yes. nice. Can I ask one more question before I then, sorry, come yes. to the end. I, I was wondering, you know, with, with earthquakes, people have, you know, they assess the, the severity of the earthquake and scales. So I'm, I'm wondering how big is yes. that? I mean, this is, you ended up with the work which done and you, you showed yes. certain avenues, but for our, you know, both for our academic understanding yes. of, you know, all these areas that talked about, you know, the anthropology, the sociology, the history, um, but also yeah. for, 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 for current practices in terms yeah. of, you know, where, 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 you know, where are the communities going? How much can, you know, is this being used or should be used for, for moving into more formal education? You know, is yeah. that something, you know, you have yeah. to have a project yeah. where you use Ajami for the yeah. house of, you know, we have, you have, and so as we work with Kano University, with the Bayou University in Kano, on, on a similar thing saying, you know, it's all nice and well to have these, all these training manuals, which then people can't read. Why don't we do it in Ajami? So, right. so there's this element as well. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. In fact, there were, in the 1980s, there was an, there was an effort by ISESCO, which is the equivalent of the UNESCO for the Muslim world, which is based in Morocco. So they tried actually to standardize all these forms of ajumi so they could use it to develop educational materials and include them in the public school. Right? But the effort didn't work out because it was, they use a top-down approach. So rather than using from the pool of the letters that already exist that are being used and to standardize it from the bottom, they borrowed letters from Urdu and Parsi and, and, and Persian 
So they try to teach foreign letters to these Ajami users. Well, what happened is that in the workshop, they gave them, they gave them resources. But once the resources were over, they, they fell back to, to the old tradition, okay? So, but I think that there are now more interest, a little, uh, especially in Francophone Africa, as uh, health issues arise. Like, for example, uh, with the COVID now, I saw some advertisement by the Ministry of Public Health actually using Ajami in rural areas. I think this is a great development, okay? So they're now using, for example, they just had one of the biggest uh, uh, gatherings, celebrations of, uh, 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 in Senegal, which is called the Magal, which is second to after the uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, which brings about 2 million people together. So Senegal has one of the lowest uh, rates of uh, COVID well controlled in Senegal. But part of the reason is that they're using actually in this community, they're using Ajami to reach the masses. Right? So uh, social distancing, you know, places to wash your hand and all of those things. So I think there is now a growing recognition of, of, of the need to find ways to incorporate, you know, these forms of grassroots literacies into the public uh, uh, domain. The challenge is, is this will, political will enduring? I don't know. Uh, so that's, those are political issues. But, but there are clearly, uh, and the diaspora dimension is important. So the financial transactions uh, that are done within the diaspora that actually evade the formal system is done through the system, <laughs> through the system. <laughs> so so I think I think there is a that there's a lot of uh, potentials, and I think that um, uh, maybe with this new uh, health issues and uh, uh, the realization of the need to reach to the masses, this may expand uh, the use of Ajami and maybe leading the government to take it seriously. But I wanted to add one thing before I finish on this point: for linguists like you and I, these texts are mined from a ling from a diachronic point of view. I mean, I can see. I, I can see how Wolof evolved <laughs> from, from the texts that were produced, say, in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. You can see, you can see how the phonology is actually changing. The rules that existed, you know, in the 19th century from rules that existed now as a result of borrowings. Okay? But you can see, if you wanted to reconstruct proto Wolof, I mean, these texts are mine, right? They also capture the ecology, the changing ecology. I didn't know that there were lions in the Sahelian region of Senegal, particularly in the Jurbel area. But if you read some of these documents, some of them pray, pray for God and the bumper to protect them from this particular type of lion. <laughs> and they give the name of, the, <laughs> of that kind of lion. So there were different types of lions clearly that existed in the area and that uh, posed threat to them. So it allows you really to, to, to capture both linguistic evolution, but also social, cultural, and ecological changes that took place in this area. Yeah. So it's really a mind of, of knowledge that um, we're, you know, we, 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 we're beginning to, to open up here. Ah, so it seems the impact is uh, big. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yes. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to have a look at the, at the Q&A. We have a number of questions. Um, I'm taking maybe the first couple together. Um, there is a question, it's amazing presentation, thank you. So there's very positive, positive notes in the Q&A. Um, the first question is whether it's possible to translate into Ajami and I, you know, I'm, you know, actually, yeah, I'll just leave it to you. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. Just linking back to, you know, the decentering mm -hmm. of knowledge and the decolonial uh, discussion we yeah. started. Um, there's another question, um, which is, it's, it's again about, you know, it's, it's about the, the technicalities, if you like. And is, I want to ask whether Ajami text and Wolof is for, for, sorry phoneticized yeah okay um, so that you know yeah it, it, you know, the, the sound sound graphene yeah, relation. sure yeah um and another question um is about um hausa islamic script i have seen some hausa islamic scripts which is more square and predominantly uh -huh, in red okay, yeah. which was explained as anonym, yeah. anonymously anonymously an, anonymously uh -huh. um by a museum could this have been a, a jami Okay. Um, so I leave these three questions, if you could uh, speak to yeah, them, and sure. then I have more coming yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, this is a great question. On the first one, translation in, uh, into Ajimi. Yes. Uh, in fact, again, as I said, this is so interesting. And, and that relates to the question you asked earlier. 
there are growing recognition by the government that these IMUs are actually important constituencies. And you will be shocked. They're not the poorest. They're actually very successful because they control the informal economy. They are the shopkeepers. They are the market uh, merchants, okay? And, and, and they also occupy large areas where chronic schools are the basic institutions of education. Right? So in elections, in the past elections, <laughs> The government of uh, the party, the ruling party, wanted to uh, make changes in the constitution. And there were a lot of resistance in those areas. Well, they drafted, those, they found ways, <laughs> they probably hired some of those scribes, and they translated from French the changes into the constitution into Ajimi. And these days, they did not use the imported letters, they actually used the local, <laughs> local letters. And the 15 points were actually conveyed through Ajami in the Jurbel area. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't pass. Those points didn't pass because they were opposed to it. <laughs> okay. So I, I think the point is translation is actually possible. And uh, because now people are realizing that basically it's language to language. I mean, it's from English to French, or just like uh, it could be from English to French, it could be from French to all of Ajami. So that's not a problem there. Uh, public health materials are actually translated, as I said. Huh? So wash your hands, you know, social distancing, all of those are translated. And you can find signs actually, you know, which are translated from public health materials. Mm -hmm. Phoneticize, this is so interesting. In fact, Ajami writings are phoneticized. <laughs> They're based on phonetics. <laughs> so the three dots that you see are actually marking voicing or devoicing. <laughs> For example, the bar in this case is voice, right? To, to show the voicing, you're using three dots. In the wall of community, you use three dots to show this is the devoicing, <laughs> okay? And you would see that in fact, it's, it's actually closer to the phonetic rendering than general orthography, right? Because as we know, orthography philosophy can be written with PH, uh, but fall can be written with an F. Okay, that variation is actually very, very rare to see that in Ajami text. They're closer to the, to the phonetic rendering because again, people are writing as they're speaking, as they're hearing, okay. The variations become, uh, uh, because it's not standardized, everybody within the community have their own understanding of how to represent one particular phoneme, okay. So that's why when standardization were to happen, it would, it would actually be easy if you draw it from the bottom up. Say, look at all the ways they use to write P. Are they using two dots or three dots? Ask them to pick one <laughs> and standardize from there, rather than teaching them on Urdu P, <laughs> which is different, which is different. Okay. So I think, I think, um, and, and let, let me add another point. This is also linguistically very interesting. The segmentation of words of a, of a morpheme. Of a, of a lexical item is very different from the way they segment their structures. Their structure seems to be segmented based on thoughts, units of thought. What, what it means? A verb phrase could be one, could be transcribed as one, <laughs> okay? I am hungry could be written as one chunk. Or, or, or uh, I am at home. The at home could be written as one chunk. Because they are not think they're not writing uh, 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 you know isolating these structures as in, in an isolating language. They're writing it expressing units of thoughts. Okay? So that's why, in fact, you have to understand that logic. Okay? Because if you understand that logic, then you can actually break these structures. Okay. So uh, Another, the other question is about, yes, this is interesting. This is the variation of the square writings. This is the variation of style. So there are different styles that a text that could be used to write a text. This is not, these are styles, there's a Mag, what, what the, the person is asking about is actually referred to the Maghribi writing style, right? So the Maghribi writing style is one of the many writing style that exists. In the West African region, the Maghribi, that writing style is the most dominant, right? Because it's derived from the old 
Quranic copies that were marketed in the region, right? So you will find them among the Wolof, you will find them among the Hausa, but they can be used in Arabic texts as well as in Ajami texts, because these are just styles of writing. It's like when you were writing English with uh, a calligraphic form, okay? Or you're writing in cursive, you know? So these are forms. So there are several ones. There are even in some communities, you have local invented writing forms that vary from the Maghribi, like in Kano, you have the Kanawi writing system. Uh, in, 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 in Borno, you have the Barnawi writing system. Uh, among the Sahara, say among the Mauritanians, you have the Saharawi, which is very thin, very thin and light. Okay, so these are, these are different styles of writing that are found both in Arabic and Ajami texts, and they're not necessarily only for one or the other. Okay, so but these are just part of the writing uh, systems that exist, you know. And calligraphy, I need to note, is very, very important in the Islamic tradition. Some of the, the some of the images are shown earlier when that kid was writing a copy of the Quran. The second phase after he finished copying the verses is to add artistic dimensions. Mm -hmm. Calligraphy becomes very very important in Islam because we in, in Muslim do not represent visual representation of the Prophet or God. So calligraphy has become the default Islamic art. And it, because it, it begins from the Quranic writing, it also expands. So many of these are actually great, great artists. Many of these Ajami users are actually great. You will find drawings and beautiful uh, maps sometimes, flowers. And this is another element that is also very interesting. Many of these artistic creations are also localized. So there will be painting or writing things that draw from Islamic tradition, but also reflects local ecologies. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, and I think it just shows multiple ways in which Islam is finding, uh, is adjusting to local ecologies, whether it's the, uh, the, the you know, architecture, but also whether it's the writing or even how to make, to make uh, bookshelves, leather bookshelves. You can see leather bookshelves in Senegal uh, are influenced by local environment. So you can see the colors of, of, of the local environment, you know, so you could see the local skills. And it's the same way in uh, Nigeria and other places. So, so I would respond there that the square writing form is just one of the many styles of writing that exists in the region. Brilliant, thank, thank you very much. Um, we are moving on a little bit now to the, to the sociology um, of, of, of your talk on the, you know, um, the Ajami writing. Um, it's a question from, from Anneke Newman. I want to read that out. It's a bit longer, but bear with me. Uh, first of all, your presentation is blowing my mind. So we have lots of very, very positive comments here throughout, mm -hmm. uh, throughout the Q&A. Um, I did my PhD in educational strategies in Futa Toro, Senegal. Uh -huh. And I first uh, saw Ajami uh, when, when a 20 year old Quranic school student asked me to teach him French. And he used Arabic script to write down the vocabulary. That's right. My question is that in Futa Toro, mm -hmm. the Halpula Torobe, the cleric, um, cleric lineages, deliberately, deliberately restricted the teaching of Ajami, knowing the power of this knowledge. That's right. Hence, That's like some other families, mm -hmm. like the Galunke, mm -hmm. the same for slaves, yeah. have embraced literacy, literacy classes in Pula since the 1990s, mm -hmm. and French too, of course. Yeah. Could you speak to this dynamic and how West African Muslim elites have deliberately restricted access to Ajami literacy, both historically and in the present day, if relevant? Um, it is the opposite to the examples you are giving um, mm -hmm. or the democratization of widespread use of Ajami yeah. literacies. That's a great question. That's a great, great question. And I was, uh, I, well, I'm grateful because Fudo Toro is very unique and, and this question touches to that, 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 that central issue. So first, as she's correct, that uh, uh, the Futa Toro has uh, uh, restricted Ajami use. And that goes back to the founder of Futa Toro itself. <laughs> so although the Futa, the Fulbe in Futa Toro are Fulbe just like the Futa Jalon and the Fula Kunda and the Ful Fulde in Northern Nigeria, Al-Hajj Omar Tal, 
who is the founder, one of the most important jihadist movement who created a um, one of the uh, largest uh, Islamic state in West Africa, discouraged purposefully his community not to use uh, Ajami because of, of the fear that it will put in danger Arabic. <laughs> so that positioning, that political positioning is very, very important because he even had confrontations with another pro Ajami scholar in Futa Jalon called Cherno Mombeya. So when, when Elijah Omar met Cherno Mombeya and found Cherno Mombeya was writing this beautiful poem in Ajami called Ogir de Malal, Veins of Eternal Happiness. Elijah Omar told him, you should stop, refrain from writing in the local language when you talk about Islam, because you were putting in danger the language of the Quran and the language of Prophet Muhammad. Well, because at that point, Elijah Omar was a, was a clerical warrior. If he warns you, you better listen. So Mombeya was forced to respond to that accusation by giving the argument that I'm talking to farmers and herders. How will I teach them the beauty of the Quran and Prophet Muhammad if I don't use their tongue? Okay. And because of that tradition, Futa Jalon, in Futa Jalon, Ajami has flourished. While in Futa Toro, where this person is talking about Ajami has not flourished. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and I think that's because of these two opposing ideologies of language. One that I call the monoglossic ideology of language. Those who think that God is monolingual and that the Quran and, and Islam must only be conveyed through Arabic. And the other group that thinks uh, the, the, the polyglossic ideology of language, that God is multilingual and that he can understand all the languages. And these two groups are very, in fact, they, they exchange fire very commonly in the Ajami literature, in the Ajami literature, okay? So, so that, that, makes very, that makes sense. And the fact that uh, the person who asked the question realized that there were actually Ajami literacy there because these people were able to write French in, uh, in, in the Arabic script, which is French Ajami, is not surprising because the Quranic schools are there. But, but the institutional support and the leadership support that made it successful in the Wolof, in the Hausa, in the Full Full Day, in the Futa Jalon was not there in the case of Futa Tor. Okay. And I think, I think finally, this, is, this brings me to another important dimension related in, in um, Jamaica. Okay. One of the slaves who was brought there called Abu Bakr as Siddiqui when his master realized that he was more educated than he was, he asked him to keep record of the plantation in English. Well, by that time, Abu Bakr only knew English and needed to keep the record in English. And he did just like these guys did to write French with the Arabic script. He wrote, kept the records of the plantations in, in English using Ajami. So English has been written also <laughs> with, <laughs> with Ajami scripts. <laughs> No, this is a great question. And so uh, I completely agree that the restricted forms of literacy in Futa Toro contrast very sharply, say, with Futa Jalon and their Fula. Okay? And that's because of, uh, according to scholars, the uh, uh, monoglossic ideology that uh, Alaj Omar took that so Ajami, the growth of Ajami as endangering the Quran and Arabic, and others took a different view. That's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, and also wonderful answer. It really shows very, very nicely how how political context, historical right. context. You know, you have to understand in yeah. which context language operates in order to see what functions fulfill. Yeah. So it's a very, very nice example. Um, let us stay with with usage across different groups. There's a question um, from a former colleague of ours, actually, Alena Retova. Uh, welcome, Alena. Um, thank you for this wonderful lecture. I've really enjoyed it. You mentioned that Ajami was particularly common in the Muridiya. Uh -huh. How is it in the other Sufi orders? Uh, good. Do most good poets use Ajami to compose poems, or do they also use Roman scripts? I'm okay. thinking of the collections of a poem, a pensée philosophique Wolof, uh -huh. edited by Asane Sila, uh -huh. which brings together poems from Wolof from all of the four orders. 
would these originally would these have originally been written in Ajami or Roman script? That's a great question. That's a great question. So first, why the Muridia have used Ajami? We talk, we were just talking about how ideology and politics is important, right? So remember the Muridia was born uh, as a rupture from uh, the Tijaniya and the Khadriya. So when the Muridia was, was, was first uh, uh, born, it was stigmatized as the order of the uneducated. <laughs> Sheikh Amur Bamba was regarded as a heretic because he did not follow uh, the, the continual teaching of the Quranic school system and the, the framework that he found. In fact, he came to reform the Quranic school system. And, and so the Muridiyah was stigmatized as by the Tijani and the Khadriya as the variety of Islam of the masses, the uneducated one. And they were even saying that to have a child who become, to be an orphan doesn't mean to lose your child. To be an orphan means to lose your child to the Muridiyah. Right? And so, therefore, Bamba had in his hands a lot of people who are uneducated and who are adults. You can't send these people to the Quranic schools. <laughs> he had to invent a new way of teaching them. And that's why the founding days of the Muridiyah were very difficult. And it was really like a boot camp. That's what he had, where he would teach them. And the best way to teach these people was through their language. <laughs> And he had, he had scholars who were actually writing in, who were great poets writing Arabic poets by Jahate, Musaka, Samba Jarambay. He told them, no, you should convert my, my ethos into Wolof so these masses can understand. Let me continue to write in Arabic and engage the Muslim intelligentsia. But you, your responsibility as my disciples is to convey my own thoughts to the masses. So, so you can see, this is the reason why among the Muridiyah, Ajami has expanded, exploded, and it has been used as a key means of mass communication, okay? In the other Sufi orders, you have Arabic dominating. You, have, you still have Ajami, but remember, these are elite. You know, they trace their education to Fez, Morocco, for the Tijaniyah, uh, where Sheikh Ahmed Tijan is buried. The Abdul Khad, uh, the for the Khadriya, they have connections with Mauritania, okay, uh, where Arabic is spoken, okay. So the liturgical texts are mostly in Arabic, right? So they do have Ajami, but they don't use Ajami with the same mass communication strategy that the Murids have done, okay. So that's the reason why, you know, you can see even today, all the local presses that produce Ajami documents are owned by Murids. <laughs> Even other communities, if they want to print their material, they go to Murid businesses, <laughs> Murid businesses, because of the long traditions of Murids using Ajimi as the badge of their identity. Okay, so that's important. On the, on the poems that you mentioned with the, uh, the Asan Silla, it's interesting that Asan Silla actually did some good work among the lions. Uh, collecting some poems, some Ajami poems among the lions. In fact, the lions are a uh, little studied compared to the Khadriya, the Tijaniya, and the Muris. But the, yeah, the lions also have produced some important Ajami po poems. In fact, I have I have one collection here. Uh, so uh, some of the poems that are written in in, uh, uh, in in with the Latin script, you write. Some of them are translated from Ajami. Uh, there is, uh, in fact, some of the most important, two very popular poems called Jar Jari Borom Tuba. No, excuse me. Jazau Shakur Buyonu Geji and Jazau Shakur Buyonu Jeriji. And these are two masterpieces by Mbai Jahate, you know, Musaka, that documents the Sufi life of Sheikh Amur Bamba with the deportations in Gabon, in Mauritania, have been regularly translated into French. Okay, and it's also very interesting to note that many of the singers, local musicians, whether they know it or not, have been influenced by the power of the voices that they have heard in these Ajami texts because these are chanted and they have blended with the local popular consciousness. 
So you will find some phrases in some songs. If you know the text, I could, you could just pull it out because they, they came here. They may not know because for, his, for a long time, these chantings, these poems, these teachings have blended with the popular, popular consciousness. Okay, so uh, you have the text, some, some Ajami texts that are translated, transcribed, okay? But you also have, and I will end the texts in Roman script that are more recent and that are not translated in Ajami, okay? So uh, many of the writing, writings by non, by uh, Europhone scholars, and I mean the scholars who come from the French colonial system uh, that is inherited by Senegal, they're unaware of the Ajami traditions, okay? I think now they're knowing, uh, they're learning about it little by little. And many of them write in, in French, okay? But Asan Silla, uh, it's important that you note, you noted him. He actually was aware of it and he has actually collected some texts from the Lion community, some Ajami texts that he studied. So this is a great question. Thank you. And, um, thank you. Um, you just mentioned education as being really important. So I want to now come to uh, two questions referring to that. So there's a question um, by Abel Gaia. Could you please elaborate on the politics of integrating Ajami-based or Arabic-based basic, secondary, and tertiary education in West Africa, as well as connections with such formal education in North Africa and indeed Saudi Arabia? Um, and there's a related question by Francis Uhumuibi. Is Ajami taught in schools and used as one of the languages in government institutions? Um, so that refers to schools education. Okay. Uh, yep, so both questions starts uh, on the use of Ajami in public education. The challenge with these Ajami traditions is that uh, there are two areas I think that are worth discussing here. The Francophone world is completely different from the Anglophone world, right? As you all know, the colonial models are different, right? Uh, so the general uh, direct assimilation rule and the general indirect assimilation rule used by the British and the French have implications on local languages. That's number one, right? So the promotion of other local languages besides French in Francophone, in the Francophone world is very challenging, <laughs> that's to begin with, okay? Let alone using another script that is non-Roman script. <laughs> so the challenges are doubled there, right? So, which means there will be more work, okay? If one were to include Ajimi Wolof or Ajimi Hausa or Ajimi uh, Fula, uh, in the curriculum in Francophone, in French-speaking Africa, than say in Anglophone Africa, where actually some of these languages are already being, like Swahili, for example, are already being used in elementary and, and in Kenya and other places, right? So there are these two historical elements, right? But the practical element, but the practical element, I think that there have been some pilot studies in Senegambia, for example, particularly in Senegal, where some schools, are called pilot schools, where they began to train students to use Wolof, which is a dominant language, to teach elementary and middle school subjects, and to compare the, uh, the, the, the success rate compared to those who were in full French-based system. It, it was clear that the outcome that the students learn much better when they're taught in their own languages, but there was no political effort to sustain that, that, that effort because it would require what? It would require training new teachers uh, who would be uh, capable of teaching in wall of mathematics, <laughs> right? geography, producing new uh, didactic instructional materials. And if you add to that Ajimi, teaching them Ajimi, those who are literate becomes illiterate now, <laughs> you see? And I think those, all of those are efforts uh, that require financial investment and also political and ideological will. And I don't think that the Francophone governments are quite there yet. I think they're moving little by little because uh, local circumstances are forcing them, say the, the Ebola uh, crisis and the current COVID uh, and then some political decisions when they need to convey some messages in particular communities, they can see the relevance of these, 
doc, you know, this system. But as a way to make it an official system, which I think would be the best approach, you know, I don't think they they quite yet. Okay, I think that it might be much easier in Anglophone Africa, uh, and um, because of the history. But there too, I don't know how willing are the politicians. Uh, 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 will the politician be? And finally, I'd ask the same question to the former minister of uh, foreign affairs, uh, who was uh, who came to BU for a talk called Gajo. Uh, so I told him, so uh, minister, why don't you include Ajimi in your educational system? Because it looks like it is so bizarre that these things only happen in Africa. You have a mass who speaks and uses one system, and you have an elite who doesn't communicate with the masses because they, they, they live in France when they're in Senegal. How can you address the gap? He told me, you know, mon frère, if we acknowledge Ajimi and we put it in the system as an official system, we will all become illiterate, <laughs> which is partly true, you know? So I think that he was honest to say that, uh, to highlight that it, it, it requires complete changing and, and investments that I don't I do not think that the governments are there yet because the educational system is grounded into the French model which is largely supported by France by by, by French uh, you know um, uh, institutions okay so a real political will like the will demonstrated by um, Rwanda which is political will to shift from French to English it's, it's a similar will that will do it. And I don't think we're there yet in the Francophone, Francophone world. So it's a challenging one. I think it would be ideal. I think it would be, it would be ideal. There is one university in, uh, I forget, there's one university that is being born in a Tuba area built by the Murids and they plan to include Ajami. So we'll see, yeah? so we'll see. We'll see. Mm, that's really interesting. Thank you. It puts a really great context also to the one slide you had where you said that the, the orange, the mobile phone company is ahead of the yes, government. Yes, yes, Precisely, yes. you know, yes. seeing that, uh, that dynamics. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, let me look at some other questions. There is a question here from uh, Yesha. Can you elaborate on the point you made about finding elements of Ajami across Africa, African diaspora and the Americas, including Caribbean? So okay. that's the international dimension. Yeah. Mm. That's great. Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, that's interesting because uh, recent studies have shown that some of the early slaves who were brought to the Americas, about between 16 to 20 percent were Muslim from West Africa. And Islam has been in the area for centuries before they were enslaved. The most common story that is known is the story of Omar ibn Said, who was captured in Senegambia and shipped to the Americas. He was a fuller, uh, literate, a dual literacy, just as I've shown, went through the Quranic schools, just like those kids, went to the highest level, was able to read and write in those multilingual languages and, and, and script, and was captured during war and shipped to the Americas. So he ended up writing his biography. He lived in the, in, in the Carolinas and uh, his literacy actually enabled him to be freed later at his old age and died with respect. There, there are many of them. There's another one, Suleiman Jallo. Uh, there's another one I just talked about, Abu Bakr al-Siddiqui. And there are more cases in Brazil. Uh, the Malay revolt uh, uh, in uh, uh, Salvador de Bahia, uh, uh, they found in the pockets of many of these uh, slaves who revolted. Uh, uh, bilingual Arabic and, uh, and Ajami documents. Some of those languages can't be deciphered now because we haven't studied. They haven't studied them because they're not they're not Arabic. Okay, so which means that the the uh, the traditions, the African traditions of Ajami has been brought to the diaspora centuries before. Right? In Brazil, for example, what what's interesting is after the slave revolt the Portuguese government criminalized Arabic and anything that looks like Arabic <laughs> because they had believed that these rebels were using this script, this system to communicate and convey messages, which led later to the, uh, uh, to the uh, falling 
of of the use of of Arabic and uh, and and uh, the Arabic script, right? But in other places, in fact, people have continued to read and write and produce letters. There is a new book by Oxford University Press by a colleague, and 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 and, and it's, it's beautiful. There's even uh, I think uh, an online conversation with the author. Even the president of the United States, uh, Thomas Jefferson, was 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 struggling with these theological and ideological and, 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 and epistemological issues. He had, they found in his letters, actually letters written by slaves that puzzled him. How can we keep these people enslaved when they can read and write in a language I who has traveled around the world, one of the most educated can read. And that posed to him really moral challenges. Right? So, there are those documents, but the problem is many of them are misclassified as unreadable Arabic or bad Arabic because, uh, because people remember they can read the Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, which is in good Arabic, like in that contract. But the rest could be a curse against Adolf Hitler. <laughs> it, could be, it, could be, it could be a contract. Okay, and I think that means you know there are work to be done to collect some of these texts and to study them. Right? But that's the historical dimension. When I was in Senegal um, about two years ago, I found a document uh, that has a copy, a similar copy, at the Harvard Stacks, dated in the 1700s. That document that I found at the Harvard Stacks Library. I found a copy in the field being used. And the document is, is, a, is an incantation when you, are in, when you are in distress. How do you use the supernatural powers to, to, to diffuse the tension and to protect yourself? So a text of, written in the 1700s, I found a copy, a similar copy being used today in Senegambia, clearly which tells you they're drawing from the same knowledge. And that knowledge is still there. And there's a connection that I think these texts allow us to perform, uh, to do, which were not possible before. And finally, the, you know, the, the international dimension. Migration, I have a student who is now in Brazil doing his PhD following the Murid uh, immigrants in Brazil. They're producing Ajami texts as they keep records of their businesses, just like the ones I have shown. They are probably producing Portuguese Ajami, <laughs> right? because they're living in Brazil, right? And they, they have also moved into the digital space, right? So they're posting bilingual Ajimi and uh, Arabic texts you know, that, that, that relate to their preoccupation. So I think this is a complete new area uh, that deserves investigation. And I think it would be great to have a PhD student uh, who would be interested in making these connections uh, in more tangible ways using uh, these Arabic and uh, bilingual Arabic Ajami texts. So this is a great question. Uh, thank you, thank you. We remain international. I think there's a number of questions. I have one on the treaty with the King of France. Uh -huh. um, and then after that, we're moving to East Africa, which uh, you okay. mentioned a couple of times. Um, but let us go to Malik's question. Um, if I may follow up, please, Professor Ngom. Um, 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 taking the sample of the agreement between the King of Bara and France. Now, I'm assuming the message are in French and Ajami Maninka. Where does the two meet and how both understand each other? Okay, By the good. way, I'm from Gambia, Senegambia. That's good. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Huh? Well, actually, that's the, uh, the text was actually Wolof, not Maninka. That is interesting. So, What's interesting, let me, let me talk about that first and I'll go to the historical issue. So this was the, this was the oldest text that I found written in Wall of Ajimi because uh, uh, the ones that I have that have been produced by the Muris go as far back the uh, 1890s, okay? So, so uh, this text was actually, I remember the Wolofs were the latest to be Islamized. So Islamization of the Wolof is very recent compared to the full bed of Mandinka and all this, okay? So, which means that before the colonial division between Senegal, Francophone and uh, Gambia, Anglophone, these were part of the same polities. 
and the king of Bar lived in Albreda. Uh, I'm sure you know where is Albreda, which is a few miles from Dufure. <laughs> okay. And if you go online, you will actually see, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, you will see the, the, the ruins of the trading posts <laughs> they were talking about. They were talking about. Okay. So what's interesting in this is that, in fact, the king of Bar was behaving as a monarch, as a, as a respectable king. And in this case, actually, the balance of power was in favor of king of Bar because the king of France was just crowned it and was looking for uh, uh, opportunities for trade. When he came around there uh, for my Gambian brother, the, it's the Nyominka, the Nyominka who operated as the naval force of King of Ba. The Nyominka now are known to be fishermen, serial fishermen, but they once served uh, as the people responsible for the navigation along the, the, uh, uh, the Gambian River. So they asked him, so what are you doing here in our land? And he said, well, I'm here for peace. Uh, I hear, I hear, I'm here to look for opportunity to do business and say, well, if that's the case, we have to bring you to our king so you can talk to our king. And that's how King Louis XVIII was brought to King of Bar. And when he arrived and the king welcomed him as a, as a guest and honor, I said, okay, since you are for peace, tell us what you're interested in. And then he said what he wanted and they translated to the local monarch, King of Bar. He understood. But of course, as, as, a, as, a, you know, as a monarch used to bureaucracy, he said, let's, let's have this in writing. Okay? And then he asked you know, the King of France to uh, have his proposition in writing. And the King of France clearly had his scribes, asked his scribe to write down his proposition. And the King of Bar also responded to the proposition asking his scribe to do the same. This became a joint agreement. So the point here is, again, you can see that uh, it reflects balance of power. <laughs> it is so interesting that the king of Bar, his descendants, and the Mandinkas, and all the people who use Agami from that time to now are now disregarded in official literacy statistics. Okay. So, so that's why I'm interested, in fact, um, maybe we should uh, exchange uh, notes, because I'm planning to go to the Gambia uh, if COVID uh, allows, uh, to look at all the Ajami resources, documents produced in that area. You know, it seems that some of the oldest forms of all of Ajami documents are produced in this area. I suspect you, you, you would also have Mandinka, old Mandinka documents, especially in the Jaro Barakunda, Barakunda area, where you have old and long established traditions and the Combo, especially in the Combo area. Yeah. So, so I think that, um, this is just one of the many puzzles uh, and a drop in the ocean of Ajami materials uh, that forces us to reconsider and to, to, to understand. There's one document uh, that I found that is also very, very interesting that shows in fact the internal cosmopolitanisms in the region. As people move, say from Wall of Land to Bijini in Guinea-Bissau, it's so interesting that when you read the literature, the French-based literature or drawing from colonial sources, it looks like wall of, the wall of people have been regarded as a center. But actually these documents show us that there are other centers. One of those centers was the Mandinka centers of, of Combo uh, and Bijini. And there's a document that actually traces the migration of wall of leaders and wall of learned families from there to Bijini and the war of independence that displaced, uh, you know, of, of the war of independence in um, uh, Guinea-Bissau that displaced many of them now in Southern Senegal in Casamance. Right? So there, I think there's a lot of information here to uh, reconnect that uh, uh, by reading and accessing these texts, we might be able to reconstruct in a more uh, plausible way, uh, the historical uh, movements of people in the region. Ah, it's a it's a wonderful resource. It's it's yeah. it's really fascinating. Um, I'm I'm moving. I think probably the last two questions. I'm taking them together because they move us to East Africa. Um, okay. one is from our own uh, colleague Angelica Basquera here at SOAS. Um, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. I work a bit on Swahili manuscripts, and I fully appreciate your research. Um, to follow on from Malika, in, in the Swahili context. 
the hierarchies of power linked to the knowledge of the Ajami, also the link to slavery and the Arab conquest of the Swahili coast. How, how to reconcile that history today? So there's a big discussion on the coast on that. So that's really interesting. And then I put the second question next to it. Um, thank you. African knowledge is vastly underestimated. Sorry, that is from Rubina. African knowledge is vastly underestimated and it is a delight to see wonderful emerging surprises. Are you aware of languages in East Africa, mm -hmm. similarly derived from Arabic? Mm -hmm. As you know, there was substantial cultural, religious and linguistic Arab influence on the East African coast. Yeah. He Swahili adopts Arabic vocabulary, but it is written in the Roman yeah. script. Yeah. Why the difference in how Arabic involved in East and West coasts? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not first, I should say, I'm not an expert of East Africa. Uh, so what I know from East Africa is based on my research and uh, bits of pieces uh, of information. One thing that I clearly see patterns, uh, I published uh, not long ago an edited volume in Islamic Africa called Ajamization of Islam in Africa. And in that volume, there were several important uh, articles that dealt with East Africa. So what's clear is that the patterns are very similar. The only difference is the script. I noted earlier that we use the Warsh based writing system, which is derived from the writing of Imam Warsh, who had a particular dialect. So for example, our F in the Warsh system is a far with a do one dot under. In the Hafs system, the far is, is one dot above. So there are variations. So our Ajami traditions are based on the Wash. Right? So in the East Africa, all the texts that I have seen are based on the Hafs, of course, because they're closer to Arabia, <laughs> okay? But the themes, the forms of the documents, you could take pretty much the same, the same. And so one document, in fact, one work that has really caught my attention is the, the use of Swahili Ajami in trade and diplomacy. Just like the, just like the document of uh, King Bar and uh, uh, King Louis XVIII, there is a work, a master's thesis, a wonderful master's thesis by uh, someone called Mitua, who did a master's thesis showing how Swahili merchants who traveled and did business around the coast up to Mo Northern Mozambique, used contract in Swahili Ajimi with local rulers, including Portuguese rulers. And that thesis has extensive copies of some of these, 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 these diplomatic documents in Swahili at the end. Right? So it seems based on that, that the writing of contract, the writing of diplomatic agreements Right was was a common practice, as it is in West Africa and East Africa. Okay, so uh, the hierarchies of knowledge and uh, the fact that Swahili is now written with the Roman script. I think the writing of Swahili with the Roman script clearly is very recent, compared to the long history of uh, Swahili in Ajimi. Okay, but. Swahili in Roman script also played an important national and ideological uh, value because it allowed during the post, you know, the, 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 the colonial struggle to unify people who are not necessarily Muslim, but who are also Swahili speakers, okay? So I think for issues of nationhood, okay? Issues of creating, say, the Ujama, the, 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 the nationhood, uh, bringing people together beyond religious differences might have been an ideological underpinning of why the, the, the Latin script might have been used as important. But in terms of hierarchies of knowledge, and I think this is again, and all the similarities we've touched on earlier. Right? So you see, for example, the Ajami in uh, Northern Nigeria, the full full day Ajami was second to Arabic in terms of prestige. <laughs> well, of course, because the teachers were fulfilled, <laughs> were fulfilled, <laughs> fulfilled, <laughs> fulfilled, <laughs> fulfilled, <laughs> right? And then Hausa Ajami came later, 
Okay, so in the times of Usman Damfudio, clearly, if you spoke full full day, it's like you know some Latin today, <laughs> you know, because you would be you would be marking yourself as an erudite. Okay, the more you speak Arabic, you will be putting yourself as, and I think that structure still exists in many Muslim communities, and that's where I think the difference is with say the Muridia. In the Muridia, Ajami has been embraced as a badge of identity of the movement. <laughs> because this movement was stigmatized as the movement of the uneducated. <laughs> so they adopted Ajimi as a badge of their membership. And that's and then and then they 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 added to that a financial support. You know, they invested in that. So they invested the history of the I looked at in my book, I looked at the history of the publishing presses of the Murids. They go back to um, 1930s. Around the 90s, they've, they've already begun to shift from copying and hand handwriting to buying Gutenberg presses and making multiple copies that they're selling. And, and these, are, these, are, these are individual Muris who invested in that. And then the leadership also supported that movement by beginning to, uh, to generate bureaucratic documents with letterheads, et cetera, right? So that kind of uh, democratization of Ajimi among the Murids is what is different from the other tradition, right? But they all have Arabic, okay? But the way uh, Ajami has been supported, I think it's, it's what's slightly different. Uh, but I agree that the hierarchy of powers is often reflected in the hierarchy of language. And in the Murid co community, that hierarchy is less, less, less uh, static. Okay, and Ajami seems to be uh, empowered uh, for ideological reasons. And compared to Hausa tradition, this is very interesting. For, for the Swahili, for the Hausa tradition and, uh, in Northern Nigeria, Usman Danfojo deployed Hausa Ajami as a strategy for his military jihad, right? To recruit the masses, he had to convey to them the, 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 the rationale, you know, to, to, he had to galvanize them for practical reasons. So he produced Ajami documents in Hausa and his daughter clearly Nana Asma also wrote in multiple languages as an effort to, to, to engage the masses. In the Murid community it's similar, but it's more expand, extensive. It's both to teach to the masses, but it's also for the masses to say, we are very proud, wall of Muslims, we are not Arab, right? And that's very important among the Murids. You know, the Muris pride themselves of defining themselves as Muslim Africans. In the same way, the Persians had presented themselves as Muslim Persians, which in the same way, all who in the same way also use Ajimi to write Persian. <laughs> okay, okay. Right. So I think the patterns are there. And these similarities, I say they actually cross regional, you know, and they just show how Islam has adapted in different areas. And this, the issues are very similar in some in many ways. They're very, very, very similar. So thank you. These are great, uh, great, great questions. Ah, brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was well, most wonderful. You. We've reached the end of, the, of our two hours. Um, and we reached the end of the questions. I should say again, there's lots and lots of praise for your presentation and the, the, you know, the, the insights you have shared with us in the in the q and a in the chat chats and i i fully agree i think it was a fascinating lecture it was really very fitting as the also the the first keynote lecture for our festival of ideas um and and looking at knowledge and and you know how how you know your what you found changes the perspective on so many different things and that's really that's so important so thank you very very much indeed i shall I, normally we would of course invite everybody to to a reception in the building but unfortunately <laughs> we can't do that uh, because okay. of COVID. Yeah. but um but you know i hope we can reconvene at some yeah. physically um i should also point out that of course the festival continues um so stay with us we have tomorrow morning um i think we are starting at um 10 a.m um with the soul mama journey breaking the cycle and healing the mother wound um, with Nihanda Truscott Reed, who is um, a holistic wellness coach and founder of the Soul Mama Journey, which supports women throughout the sacred transition from, of motherhood from conscious conception and spiritual pregnancy to mindful motherhood. Um, so that's tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. It is um, um, online 
virtual like all our events. Stay with us, look at the program. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Falu, for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Well, thank you a lot. Much. I think we generated lots of ideas and energy. Um, so I hope to be continued and we continue also with the West Africa, East Africa discussion a little bit more as well. That would be great. Most definitely. Well. Thank you very much. And Thank you very evening. much. Thank you and uh, good night in, in London and goodbye. Same to you. Bye-bye.